Hello. So just some quick announcements before we get started today. If you haven't checked out of your hotel, please go to the registration desk right at the beginning of the coffee break and people will shuttle you back and forth and have you do that. If you never signed in at all, we really need you to do that. So just also head to registration desk and sign in. Most of you guys have, so but just if you haven't. Um, if you want a van to the light rail, you can sign up at the registration desk. And posters were taken down last night, stored at the registration desk. Also, you can put luggage at the registration desk. Like, if you need anything, I guess just go to the registration desk is what it seems like. So, yeah. Cool. So, I am excited to welcome Dr. Emily Shaler. She is the Science and Education Program Manager for the National Suborbital Research Center at the NASA Ames Research Center. Emily received her PhD in Planetary Sciences from the California Institute of Technology and her BA in Physics and Geology from Dartmouth College. Prior to joining NASA, she worked as a Hubble postdoctoral fellow at the University of Hawaii and University of Arizona. Emily's research as a planetary astronomer focused on using large telescopes around the world to characterize the surface composition and atmospheres of small bodies and moons in the outer solar system. Throughout her scientific career, Emily has always had a passion for education and outreach. She joined NASA in 2011 to coordinate educational programs for the NASA Airborne Science Program. In addition, Emily directs the NASA Student Airborne Research Program, also known as SARP. It's an annual summer internship for around 30 undergraduates who get the, who get the chance to join a onboard flight in Southern California, collecting data on the Earth, ocean, and atmosphere. And then a quick little note, Emily is also a runner and a certified ballet bar instructor, so that's pretty cool. So without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to Emily. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, so it is my pleasure to be here today. I'm really excited to talk to all of you about my career journey from being a planetary scientist to now working at NASA in education. And it's a travel log because a lot of um, the stories uh, take place in a specific location in the world and, um, and traveling is something that's very important to me and something I've tried to, to um, to get more of during my career. And so you'll see as we go through this um, the different places that I've gotten to go because of science. Um, so just to give you a little outline of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about why I majored in physics and how I almost dropped out of freshman physics, um, how doing a NASA internship changed my life. Um, we'll be talking, I, I'll do little, little stories about some of the science that I've done during my career, um, and then talk to you about why I decided to transition from out of academia into working for NASA and the Airborne Science Program. Um, so to start, um, I grew up here in, uh, in Norwich, Vermont, which is a really tiny, small town, um, very rural, um, and in the winter, the lakes and rivers freeze over, and everybody either figure skates or plays ice hockey. Um, and I was no exception. Growing up, I was a competitive figure skater. I um, wanted to go to the Olympics at one point. This is me when I was about 12, and uh, I was pretty good, but um, didn't, make it to, <laughs> didn't make it to the Olympics, but did, get, did skate throughout high school and also into college and graduate school, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about later. Um, but uh, throughout the time I was growing up, I, was al I always loved math and science. And, but it wasn't until 11th grade when I took um, honors physics that I really decided that physics was so great. And you all are physics majors, so I don't have to, to convince you of this. But I had an absolutely amazing high school physics teacher, shout out to Mr. DeMont, um, who just really brought physics to life. And so I remember in 11th grade thinking, I'm going to go to college and major in physics. I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I'm going to major in physics. So I get to, um, um, I, I applied to a lot of schools on the, in the Northeast because I grew up there, my family was there, I didn't really even think about going outside of the Northeast. And I ended up going to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, which was just a little bit far, farther away from where I grew up. Um, so the star doesn't even move. <laughs> um, when I got to Dartmouth, I started off, you know, signed up for the honors physics, introductory physics sequence and multivariable calculus and all that. 
And I remember the first physics, uh, the, the first class I went into, there were, there were 50 students in the class, and 17 of us were women. And so this was the late 90s. You can figure out how old I am if you care to do the math. Um, so that was actually pretty good for, for then, um, having 17 out of 50 students be women. And um, I remember being a little intimidated about how smart everybody seemed and, and just you know, f be, finally being in a college classroom. And then we got our first test back. And I got a 70% on it. And I was pretty devastated because I had been, you know, pretty much straight A student the whole, all through high school. And then to suddenly in this, in this uh, you know, the field that I thought I wanted to major in and do a career in, I, I'm suddenly getting a C. And I, I remember going home and looking at the course catalog and just being like, I'm going to have to remake my life. I'm going to major in English, you know, and just all these thoughts like, what am I going to do? I, I'm not cut out for this, and, you know. And so I just had a lot of self-doubt. self, self -doubt. And then the next day I come back and I'm sitting next to a guy and he got the exact same grade that I did. And, you know, I'm going on about how I might not be good enough for this and he's just like, it was just a hard test. We just have to study harder next time. And so I think about that and... Uh, it's, and so, you know, I, I, I worked, got problems at working groups and, you know, what we all do and, uh, you know, got through that class. But by the end of that class, there were only 16 people left out of 50 that started. It was a real weed out class. And only two of us were women. So I think about those other, you know, started out 50 to 17 and then 16 to 2. And I think about all those other women that dropped, and they dropped at such a higher rate than the men dropped. And I feel like it was because they had those self-doubts like I did. And, um, and I'm just really fortunate that, that I decided to stick, stick it out. And I think about those other women and what they might have done if they had, if they had stuck it out too. So, um, so never let a bad grade derail you from what you think you want to do. So um, I'm going through college, things are going better in my physics classes, and um, I still don't really know what I want to do with a physics major. I know that I really enjoy the classes now. I was really liking some astronomy classes that I was taking as electives, as well as geology classes. And I applied to a NASA internship um, between my junior and senior year. And this, was, I, this came about because there happened to be a flyer posted in the department uh, physics hallway. Uh, the, you know, the internet was really just beginning at those stages, so you had to actually go to the Career Center or see a flyer or something like that. And so I applied for this internship out in California called the NASA Astrobiology Academy. I didn't really know much about astrobiology, but the project that I was going to be working on was studying um, the spectra of Leonid meteors as they were coming into Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so the reason that this is interesting and has astrobiological implications is we know that comets contain organic material on their surfaces. And the question that we had back then was, does any of that organic material survive entry through Earth's atmosphere? And this has implications for origin of life studies because um, at the time of the early Earth, the Earth was getting bombarded by a lot more um, uh, material. And so the question is, could some of that organic material um, that seeded life have come from cometary activity? Um, so during the summer, I just basically analyzed data that had been taken by my, by my PI at Ames, and I learned how to use IDL and program and things like that, and, um, and it was a really great summer internship experience. And in addition to doing this, uh, you know, analyzing the data that my, that my PI had taken of, of uh, spectra of meteor trails, he was planning for the 2001 Leonid meteor shower. So it just so happens that every uh, about 33 years, uh, because of the, the orientation of the Earth and the debris trail of, comet, of the comet that is responsible for this annual meteor shower, the Leonids, some, the, the meteors are very, very good, and, and, and good being there's a lot of them. And so it was predicted that there was going to be one meteor per second for several hours. So that's meteor, 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 like really amazing um, in 2001. And so he was coordinating this aircraft campaign. The peak of the storm was going to be over the Atlantic Ocean. And um, he was coordinating an, a, a campaign using a, a NASA aircraft to fly at 40,000 feet, fly around, and then have this airplane have telescopes pointing out of the top of it to take spectra of the meteors as they were coming in, which was pretty cool. And so I wasn't going to be involved in this, but I, I helped him a little bit with the planning of it because I was already going. It was in November, and I was already back um, at Dartmouth College. So I, I go back to Dartmouth College for my senior year, and then September 11th happens. And all of you are probably too young to remember, but um, it, it was absolutely um, just the, everything changed at that point. And specifically with regard to NASA centers, military bases, security was 
much more strict than it had previously been. Can, oops, this is falling. Um, than it had previously been. And so my, my PI, Peter Jeniskins, the, the one who I'd worked with on this Leonid project, he's Dutch. And they were not going to allow him to fly on his own mission um, because he was not a non-US citizen. And uh, many of the other people who were involved in this aircraft campaign to study the Leonids were also non-US citizens. So I'm back at Dartmouth my senior year, November 1st, and I get this call from Peter, and he's like, hey, can you come out to California and operate um, a telescope with a spectrograph and fly on this mission? I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I can. I'm a warm body with a US passport. Please sign me up. Um, and so, so I flew out to California, and um, Peter was not even, it was restricted from even going on base at Edwards Air Force Base, where the plane was, was um, stationed. And, and so we, we practiced in the lobby of the hotel, setting up the telescope. And I was so nervous. You know, it was, and, and so we took off, and we flew over the Atlantic Ocean um, for 12 hours. And it was absolutely spectacular. The, the, the meteors were coming down at the predicted rates. So we were getting tons and tons of spectra. And I was you know, just so nervous, wanting to make sure that I did a good job. And it turned out that um, we, so this is, this is me. <laughs> um, in my flight suit. I got to wear a nice flight suit. That's the telescope that is pointing out of the window of the airplane. So the windows are pointed up, and then the meteors are coming in, and we're getting great spectra of them. So it was an absolutely amazing internship experience um, by virtue of the fact that um, a really bad thing happened. Um, so as a result of this, I come back to Dartmouth, and I'm you know, over the moon, and I have all these things, amazing stories to write about in my grad school applications now. Um, and, uh, and I even ended up being an author on several of the papers where we determined that organic material can survive entry through Earth's atmosphere, which was a pretty neat um, astrobiological result to have. Um, so I, I come back home, and I'm applying to graduate programs, and I decide that I, I don't want to do physics. I actually want to do planetary science, because that's what I'm most excited about. Um, and there are several programs around the country that are specific to planetary science. And I, um, Caltech was my, was my reach and my, my hope that I would get in there. And it's a reach for everybody who applies. Um, but uh, I fortunately got in. And um, oops. Um, got in. Oh, yeah. And then here's. We landed in Spain for the Leonid aircraft campaign, so now I'm adding to my travel locations. Um, so, uh, we'll go through here. Um, so grad school at Caltech, um, I I went out to California and um, again for for grad school. And the great thing about um, planet, a lot of planetary programs, and I know it's similar in some physics and astronomy programs as well, is that they don't want you to decide right away which advisor you're going to work with. In, for the first year at Caltech, you had to work with two different faculty members. And I thought, going to Caltech, that I was going to be a Mars surface geology person, because I was a double major in physics and geology. Um, in the early 2000s, when I got to grad school, Mars was really exciting. You know, there were all these spacecraft that were going there, and rovers were about to land, and things like that. And so I thought that I was going to be a Mars surface geology person. And I did one of my projects with Bruce Murray, who's one of the giants in that field. He, he started the Planetary Society with Carl Sagan and um, was you know, one of the people on the Viking missions, original missions to Mars. And it was really fun learning about Mars, Mars geology. Um, and so I thought about, for my second project, what did I want to do? And I looked around at all the different faculty at Caltech. And I had done some astronomy you know, on the airplane and then also um, at Dartmouth. And I thought it'd be really cool to use uh, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Um, because Caltech had time on these telescopes, um, a large fraction of time. And, um, and there were a lot of interesting projects that were going on. And mostly, I also just really wanted to go to Hawaii. <laughs> um, so I contacted Mike. Um, so I, I started talking to Mike Brown, who at the time was a junior professor at Caltech, and he was not famous at all. And now he's quite famous because uh, he discovered lots of objects in the outer solar system that were um, of comparable size, and in a couple cases, even uh, in one case, larger than Pluto. And this forced the demotion of Pluto. And so he got all famous. And he, if you follow him on Twitter, he's at Pluto Killer or whatever. So, um, but this was all before that. He had not discovered. Uh, he had only just just very just started his survey of the outer solar system to discover these Kuiper Belt objects out by Pluto. 
And so at this point, he had discovered a few of them, and we, we wanted to understand whether um, what the, the fraction of these objects that had moons was. So we went to, to Hawaii and used the Keck telescope to um, look at these Kuiper Belt objects very, very carefully to determine if any of them were actually binaries or if they had a little moon. And um, so that was my second project. And I just loved observing. I, um, going out to Hawaii and being on the top of a mountain and having this telescope to yourself that, and you can decide where you're pointing it and what you're doing. And there, there are a few times in life where you're, you're actually you know, making a scientific discovery right there and you know that it's happening. And there's just something so romantic about being on top of uh, a mountain with a large telescope that you have control over. And <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> nowadays it's uh, a little bit less romantic because you can now operate these telescopes from your uh, computer back at home. But back in the day, you actually had to travel out to Hawaii because the internet connection was not good enough so that you could operate that telescope remotely. Um, so uh, there are still telescopes that you get to go, go to and be in remote places and things like that. But, but nowadays, it's, it's a little, the romance is a little bit less when you're just sitting there in your office, you know, like moving the telescope and the data comes down. Um, so um, after I did that project, I, I realized that I loved observing and I wanted to keep doing it. So I asked Mike about what, what types of projects and things that he was thinking about for um, uh, going forward. And Mike did a lot of different, different types of things, um, moons of outer, of, of outer solar system objects and asteroids and things like that. But the really exciting thing for me was um, Saturn's moon Titan. And this is what I ended up doing my PhD dissertation on. Um, so Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's the only moon in the solar system that has a substantial atmosphere. The surface pressure on Titan is about one and a half times greater than the surface pressure on Earth. Like Earth, the major atmospheric constituents are molecular nitrogen, um, but then that's where the similarities sort of end. The next most abundant constituent is methane, and then there's um, assorted hydrocarbons and nitriles that are formed by the photodissociation of, of N2 and CH4 in the upper atmosphere. And so for my PhD, what I wanted to do was understand the methane weather on Titan. And so to just step back for one second to just make sure we're all on the same page about, uh, about just a little background about Titan. This is a phase diagram of water, so temperature and Kelvin pressure. This E is the location of the Earth, so we have solid, liquid, and gas. And we all know that uh, liquid water is stable on the surface of the Earth, and within a very relatively narrow range of temperatures, you can have water existing as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now, Titan, the surface uh, temperature is only 95 Kelvin, so um, water is most decidedly solid. And in fact, water ice makes up the bedrock of Titan. If you're walking around on the surface, you're walking around on rocks that are made of solid water ice. But if you remember, before I told you that 2% of the atmosphere is actually made up of methane. And if you look at a phase diagram of methane, so temperature and pressure, Titan exists right here where methane is able to be liquid on the surface of Titan. And um, so this was realized for, this was realized way back in the day, and it was hypothesized, uh, being the 1940s, and it was hypothesized that Titan might support a methane-based hydrological cycle or a methanological cycle analogous to Earth's hydrological cycle, including methane clouds, methane rain, methane oceans, lakes, what have you. And again, this is all way before the Cassini spacecraft has gotten there. So this is the early 2000s. The Cassini spacecraft didn't get there until 2004. So we, this was one of the best images of Titan that existed um, from Voyager in 1980. And you see it looks just kind of like a little orange fuzzball. And the reason for that, um, so Voyager was imaging in the visible part of the spectrum. And Titan has a thick haze layer in the upper atmosphere that obscures the lower atmosphere from view. So you can't see down to the surface in the visible, and you can't even see down to the, the troposphere where we would expect to have this cloud activity going on. So right when I arrived at Caltech, um, the adaptive optic system on the Keck telescope was starting to come into use. And so we were able to use that along with imaging in the near-infrared, where in the near-infrared, photons can actually penetrate down into Titan's um, surface and lower atmosphere. And we were able to get these images of Titan, which were taken on various nights between 2001 and 2005. And these images, which you really can't see very well in this light, but that's okay, that's good enough. Um, they, if you look at them, you'll notice that there's a the little bright feature in almost every image 
Sometimes it's brighter than other times, but there's, almost, there's always a little feature located near Titan's south pole. And it turns out that these are actually tropospheric methane clouds. And this is weird, right? If you were looking at an image of the Earth like this um, and looking at where the, 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 the clouds on Earth are, sure, there are latitude bands where you're more or less likely to have cloud activity, but to have it be so concentrated in one hemisphere is, is, was sort of weird. And so what we realized was that um, it's actually quite difficult to instigate convective cloud activity on Titan because of how far away from the sun it is. And so the atmosphere is quite stable to, um, to, to cloud activity, except in the locations where you're getting the maximum amount of solar insulation. And so for the time that we were observing Titan, it was actually summer in the southern hemisphere. So Titan has an obliquity of about 27 degrees, so similar to Earth. And the year on Titan is equal to Saturn's year around the sun, so 30 Earth years long. So one season on Titan is about seven years, so the length of a PhD dissertation, or <laughs> around there. Um, and um, so what we're looking at here is that the South Pole, because of the time of year that it was, was in continuous sunlight for something like six years. And so that continuous sunlight, even though it's at an angle, um, was enough to instigate convective cloud activity in an otherwise stable atmosphere. And so, um, so we started getting these images and seeing where clouds were. And so the idea was that there would be clouds at the poles during the summers and then uh, potentially some clouds at the equator, but mostly would just be at the poles um, in, the, in, the year, in, the, uh, in the summer months or summer years. So you really can't see this very well, but um, when Cassini arrived at Saturn, it was able to fly by Titan on a pretty frequent basis and get um, high resolution images of the surface. And you've probably seen some of these. Um, these are lakes and other sort of fluvial-like features. And they saw all of these lakes and things in this, either near the South Pole or near the North Pole. And at the equatorial regions, what they saw were long extended things that looked like dunes. And so this, the whole, the whole um, idea made sense that it, on Titan, it rains at the poles during summer and then it's very dry in the equator. However, um, when the Huygens probe, so Cassini had a little probe that released from the spacecraft and parachuted down and landed on the surface. Um, and as it was, and it landed right near the equator. And where it landed looks kind of like a river, a dried up river bed. But as it was coming down, it took this image, which really looks like um, you know, a river valley or something that needs rainfall to form. And so, um, so this was kind of a mystery at the time. It's like, how can we, we don't think there should ever be any cloud activity near the equator, but yet Cassini is seeing things that seem to require rain near the equator. Um, so for my PhD, I used a variety of different telescopes to try to monitor Titan on a frequent basis to try to understand where the clouds were, how frequently they occurred, when, um, you know, uh, why did they get brighter and fainter at different times? Can we correlate that to anything? All these sorts of questions. And so I started this large-scale program of um, using the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility, which is another telescope on Mauna Kea, as well as the Keck and Gemini telescopes. And again, this is typical cloud activity on Titan when I started my PhD. And as soon as I started to observe Titan for my PhD to understand the clouds, all the clouds went away. <laughs> so um, literally, like there was just there was I put upper limits, I wrote papers, I made did models, and I was able to at least get my PhD saying, okay, well actually, you know, I guess this is expected because you know we're moving out of southern summer and so we would expect it to go away. But I, I really didn't think nobody thought it would disappear that dramatically. Um, so I was able to get my PhD and on the <laughs> on the day that I handed in my dissertation. Titan through a party. <laughs> so, um, literally, this um, the 14th is the um, was the day that I handed it into the graduate office. So, fortunately, I still downloaded my data that night because <laughs> I was thinking about going out and partying. But um, <laughs> so, um, this was very unexpected. This cloud was located at about 15 degrees um, south latitude, which is completely not predicted at all by any of the models. 
And it was so um, surprising that we, um, we submitted it to Nature and, and uh, ended up with a, a Nature publication on this to try and understand um, what, uh, why these clouds were here. And I won't go into it. Um, oh, and also the Cassini flyby. Uh, so Cassini was, was uh, orbiting Saturn. And they completely missed this event because they only flew by Saturn every six, or only flew by Titan every six weeks. And so if we hadn't been observing from the ground, nobody would have, would have caught this large cloud of activity. Um, and so we did a lot of um, uh, science on this, trying to understand if you have a cloud in one location, how can, can that instigate clouds in other locations, looking at Rossby waves and various things. We also um, determined that there's likely a tie to the surface here. Um, in looking at images of, of that location and suggested that there could potentially be some cryovolcanism or other types of, of things at that particular location. So that was my, my big science result. It, you know, it made uh, Discover Magazine um, top 100 stories of that year and things like that. And so that was um, really exciting to just um, be at the, and it was just, I, you know, I happened to be at the right place at the right time with, Doing, be, being able to observe Titan and take some of the initial measurements of understanding clouds on Titan. So during this whole time, um, I was still figure skating. So I, <laughs> I figure skated um, throughout college. And at, when, I was at, when I was at Dartmouth College, we had the Dartmouth College figure skating team. And we competed at regionals and collegiate nationals and things like that. And when I got to Caltech, I didn't want to stop skating. And so um, I found some other undergraduates who were, uh, who were former competitive figure skaters. And I convinced them that we should compete um, uh, on the West Coast. And collegiate figure skating is not an NCAA sport, so there's no um, time restrictions. You just have to be enrolled in a college university. It doesn't matter if you're an undergrad or grad student. And we actually qualified for collegiate nationals um, from the West Coast. <laughs> And this is so crazy for Caltech to actually have a sports team that succeeded in anything. Um, <laughs> if you know anything about Caltech, um, the basketball team had something like a 260-game losing streak, which they, when they finally broke that losing streak, it was, um, they were very excited across campus. So the fact that um, our little figure skating team qualified for collegiate nationals um, caused actually the Los Angeles Times to write an article about us, the title of which was Brainy Skaters May Have an Edge. And when the, the reporter was interviewing us, she was interviewing us because, um, and she was trying to get us to say things like, she would ask questions like, oh, well, are you good at figure skating because you understand the physics of it? And we would be like, yeah, sure, I guess. You know, I mean, we you know, <laughs> decrease your moment of inertia, increase your angular acceleration, you know, stuff like that. And um, so, but, but so she wrote the article sort of uh, in that vein. And so that was all well and good. And I will note that at the time, I had a, a faculty member, not my advisor, come up to me and say, at Caltech and say, oh, I saw you were in the Los Angeles Times. Too bad it wasn't for science. <laughs> oh, yeah, pain. But my advisor, the, Mike, who I ended up um, you know, doing my PhD with, he was always very supportive of outside interests. So if you, uh, there are advisors like that. Um, so I'm telling you this story because um, a couple years later, a movie producer <laughs> contacted me and said, um, hi, I'm doing this movie. How many of you have seen Ice Princess? Oh my god. I'm so sorry. OK, all right. OK, so this movie producer contacted me. Uh, now the anxiety is coming back. All right, so this movie producer contacted me. And I'm a grad student, and I'm poor. And she's like, hey, I'm, I saw this article about you in the Los Angeles Times, and I'm doing this movie about this girl who uh, is a you know, nerdy, smart girl who uh, somehow uses physics to teach herself how to figure skate and becomes a champion figure skater. Would you be a science consultant on this movie? And I'm like, sure, why not? <laughs> so um, my, my role in this science consulting venture um, was basically she sent me the script. And she said, can you add some smart sounding physics words in? So for example, I said, you know, oh, yeah, when I decrease my moment of inertia, I'll increase my angular acceleration. And you know, just threw out some random stuff that's, that's vaguely makes sense. And I even wrote out moment of inertia tensors and various equations so that they, you know, there's a few little parts in the movie where they show equations just to kind of give it some gravitas now. Um, and then I also, which was really cool, got to go to the red carpets, walk on the red carpets. And I'm really excited, right? You know, so all, my entire involvement of the, in this movie is just looking at the script, just looking at the script. 
And then they, and, and you know, I made my little comments and I got paid apparently uh, 10 times less than I should have gotten paid, but I didn't know any better. So it was still a fair amount, you know, not a lot of money, but for a grad student, it was nice. <laughs> and um, so that was my whole involvement. I wasn't there when they filmed. I wasn't there. I never saw the movie. I just was there providing them things for the script. And now if you've seen Ice Princess <laughs> and your physics majors, you'll know that the line that I wrote, which I wrote correctly, which is if I decrease my moment of inertia, I'll increase my angular acceleration. The actress, when she says it in the movie, says when I increase my moment of inertia, I'll increase my angular acceleration. And I was like, <laughs> so I'm sitting there in the, you know, in the movie premiere, and my husband, well, he was my boyfriend at the time, but he's now my husband, was sitting next to me, and he's also a scientist. He's like, <laughs> And there's, there's something else equally egregious. There's something like force is equal to mass times velocity or something that she says. I mean, it's so, so, so bad. Um, and for years, I had actual anxiety about this. I would get emails from physics professors, uh, you know, random physics professor at University of Virginia. Hi, my daughter watched this movie, and because um, I'm listed in the credits as the science consultant. And I was really disappointed with the science. And so I had this like stock email that I would send. I'm really sorry. I wasn't involved. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So lesson learned, if you are ever asked to be a physics consultant, demand to see the movie before your name goes in the credits. Okay. <laughs> so little short diversion there. Um, all right. So um, we'll, let's go back to some science stories. So as I mentioned, um, my advisor was uh, starting to get quite famous because he was discovering all these objects in the outer solar system. And if you remember that, those images of, the, of Titan being all boring, I was a little bit bored for, for some of my grad school experience. So I branched out and did some other projects, like looking at um, the surface compositions of these larger Kuiper Belt objects that Mike was finding. And in addition, we also um, had a really fun result, which was to try and figure out the mass of Eris. So Eris is this large Kuiper Belt object. And it's really difficult to know the sizes of Kuiper Belt objects because you have to make an assumption about the albedo. So you don't know whether it's you know, super reflective or super dark. Um, but for Eris, when Mike found it, if, even if it had 100% um, you know, albedo, the, it was going to be the same size as Pluto. But you know, plus or minus, you don't really know. And so um, it turns out that Eris has a little moon. And what does a moon mean? Yay, you can get mass. So, um, what we did was we went to the CAC telescope and we uh, observed Eris and its moon. And then we come back the next day and we take a picture of Eris and the moon. And the moon has moved a little bit. And then it's moved a little bit. And then it's moved a little bit. And then Kepler's laws, you can fit an orbit. So I have this science paper, um, which is probably the, you know, getting a science paper for using Kepler's laws. Um, but it was important because the mass was 25% more than Pluto. And so this was a big deal for people because um, Eris being more massive than Pluto, it forced the demotion of Pluto because if you're going to call Pluto a planet, then you have to call Eris a planet. And then you also have to call everything else that's round in the Kuiper belt a planet. And there's something like 100 of them that are round by their own gravity. And so they decided to just not have it. And if we want to talk about Pluto planet, I'm happy to have that discussion at a certain point. But this was so much fun to be able to you know, just take this first print, just do this, do this project where you're literally just trying to determine um, the mass of an object, and boom, that's a science paper. So I had, um, I had a really amazing grad school experience because I, had, I got to do all these sort of first principles science and just really uh, had a really fun time with um, what I was doing. And after I graduated from Caltech, I, I applied for a Hubble postdoctoral fellowship, which I got. Um, it's one of these prize postdocs where you can take it to wherever you want. And I took it to the University of Hawaii because I wanted to use the telescopes there because I had really enjoyed observing. And I really, um, I, en I enjoyed the research I was doing. I was continuing with some of the outer solar s studies of outer solar system objects like Eris and other large Kuiper Belt objects, continuing with my Titan research and things like that. But my heart throughout this whole process was in education and outreach. So I always, whenever there was an opportunity to go out into a school or talk to the public or do anything um, like that, I always really jumped at that chance. And I didn't, I didn't, I was sort of on this track to being a faculty member and that would have been great, but I, I knew I wanted to do more with education and outreach and I didn't really know how that was gonna come about exactly. But I kept, um, 
I kept thinking uh, that, you know, just thinking about potentially doing um, how, the, how I could parlay my scientific background into doing um, education and outreach. And so it just so happened that I was looking through a job register, um, you know, a, a job listing, and there was one for the NASA Airborne Science Program. They wanted someone with a PhD to um, coordinate educational outreach for airborne science program missions. And so I, didn't, I knew a little bit about the airborne science program because I had flown on, the, on that NASA aircraft for that Leonid campaign. But I didn't realize the full breadth of what NASA does in the Earth sciences. So NASA has a fleet of airplanes that fly all over the world doing Earth system science. So they fly over the North Pole looking at the thickness of ice or looking at um, you know, flying in cities, looking at pollution, or doing a lot of different types of Earth system science. And so this was really intriguing to me. And they, this position also wanted somebody to run a summer internship program in this field. And I had had such a great experience in my summer internship that the thought of running one was, was really appealing. So I up and left my postdoc. I had a full up year, full another year of funding left. My, my PhD advisor thought I was crazy, um, but I knew this was the right choice for me. I, this job just seemed so perfect. Um, I get to, so this is, this is uh, I'm on board the NASA DC-8. I'm holding a stuffed penguin because I'm talking to a fifth grade classroom. Uh, we're flying over the, the South Pole, near, right near the South Pole. And I'm talking to a fifth grade classroom back in Maryland, chatting with them about um, you know, what we're seeing out the window, why we're measuring the ice, why it's important to understand you know, for climate change and all that stuff. Um, here I am in Guam. We had another experiment where we were, um, uh, we were studying the tropical tropopause, and I coordinated island-wide education and outreach. It's a um, Guam has, um, you know, is a very underserved population in terms of uh, getting uh, information from uh, NASA missions to them, and so we were going into all the middle schools and high schools and um, getting to getting to to reach out to to them and tell them why our aircraft was based there, um, studying the, the the tropical tropopause. And then here I am, uh, 77 North in Thule, Greenland, um, coordinating educational outreach with, uh, with schools across the world during the, the Ice Bridge mission that was studying um, the thickness and extent of glaciers and ice sheets up in, up in Greenland. So um, during the time that I've been at NASA, I've, um, I've connected over 18,000 K-12 students directly to NASA Airborne Science Program missions. So that's a stat I'm really proud of. Um, and it's just been so much fun to get to fly on all these airborne missions, learn about Earth system science, which, you know, I'm not an Earth scientist, but um, getting to learn about all the important research that NASA does in climate change and, um, and, uh, and just, you know, studying the Earth as a system in general. And in addition, um, I get to run a summer internship program called SARP. We have at least two alumni from SARP here in the audience right now. Um, <laughs> shout out. And... Um, so SARP is an internship for students who are in between their junior and senior year. So if there are any juniors here, you can apply to SARP. Um, we accept physics majors, chemistry majors, biology majors. Students get to fly on board a NASA aircraft doing Earth system science research, um, collecting data um, on the Earth, oceans, and atmosphere in Southern California. So our students do multispectral remote sensing, atmospheric chemistry, looking at urban and rural air quality studies and just you know general environmental science from on board an airplane and each student develops an individual research project from the data collected you can see the students operating uh, the um, air sampling instrumentation here there's a student you know on board the plane our students go out into the field to take ground truth measurements it's just a really um, uh, incredible opportunity for undergrads to participate in NASA earth science research and over the, we've had 10 years of alumni, so 305 total alumni. We now have 38 PhDs, uh, 76 master's degrees, and 91 who are currently pursuing advanced degrees. So our alumni are now kind of spread out throughout the, throughout the world, and it's, it's just really an amazing experience to see what students can accomplish um, when you give them this type of uh, internship experience. And I know for myself personally, a summer internship was what really catapulted me into my scientific career. So it's an amazing experience for me to be able to, to give that back to, um, to, to up and coming students. And if, if there are any juniors and you want to apply, the application is right here. The deadline is in two weeks. <laughs> so. Um, so I've been told to keep this to 35 minutes, which I think I'm over a little bit. So I will uh, wrap up now. But um, so this is where I grew up. 
And because of my scientific career, um, these are all of the places that I've gotten to go because of science. Um, so it's been a really amazing journey, and um, I, I have a few lessons learned. So don't let a bad grade derail you from the path that you want to be on. If interests outside of science are important to you, make sure you choose a PhD advisor who is okay with that. They do exist. <laughs> um, don't worry if you don't know exactly what you want to do. Just keep working hard and be open to new opportunities as they come along. And don't be afraid to change course from what you thought you wanted. I completely got off the academic track, and I couldn't be happier about that. Um, and inspiring and enabling the dreams of others can be incredibly rewarding. I never realized that until I got into the position that I, that I am now. And finally, if you are ever a science consultant <laughs> on a movie, <laughs> demand to see the movie before it is released if, you, if your name is going to be in the credits. So thank you very much. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you ever have a background in astrochemistry? No, not at all. And in fact, that would have been useful <laughs> for some of my Titan research. I, my chemistry background was, you know, I took two semesters of it in, in college. And then I took one graduate level course on you know, planetary astronomy that had some chemistry background. But, but that, is a, that is a way into planetary science. There are people who come with a chemistry background and then um, do more chemistry focused studies. Yeah. Oh, yeah, repeating the question. So the question was, uh, did I have an astrochemistry background? And I didn't really. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if you know that you want to be an observer, um, I would recommend for when you're looking at grad schools, look at which schools have time on which telescopes. So depending on the way it works is um, schools buy time or they, were, they um, were part of the construction of the telescope. And so for Caltech, we had 40% of the time on the, on the two Keck telescopes. And, but there are other schools that you know maybe bought 100% of the time on some other telescope in Arizona or Chile or wherever it is. And so it, if, if you know that you want to be an observer, you want to have the most access to telescopes. And so I would basically really zone, zone in on programs that, and schools that have telescope <laughs> access. So that's all the UC schools have, a lot, have good telescope access. Um, Caltech, University of Arizona. Um, Harvard, uh, I mean, there, there's many different telescopes all around the world. Even uh, University of Central Florida now has a lot of time on, uh, on uh, the telescopes on the Canary Islands. So there's, there's a lot of different places and, you know, different, different schools and, yeah, so they have telescopes. Yes? Yeah, um, so any advice on getting into NASA? I, for me, it, it sort of was weird in that I, you know, it just sort of fell in my lap. I saw this job ad, and it definitely helped that I had had that NASA internship because I was able to talk about, hey, you know, I flew on the, on the DC-8, and I did this. So I would say um, internships, intern.nasa.gov is now our one-stop shop for all NASA internships. That's undergraduate level, but also graduate level internships. Um, hopefully that website is still up. It may not be because of the government shutdown right now, but it will be coming back. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I would highly recommend getting an internship because that, that will get your foot in the door. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it really depends on the program. Um, there's so many different different types of things now, and there, it's so much easier to search for it. I mean, back in my day, you know, I just heard about the one thing, and and but now you can go on intern.nasa.gov and you can apply to 15 things at one time. Um, so I would, you know, and then so there's there's advantages. So REUs typically are you're more working with just one person, whereas an internship you might. 
you might be in a larger group of students or things like that. But, but there are variations across programs. So again, just, just doing your due diligence and checking it out. Yeah. I think the fact that I learned how to code during that internship was key. Um, coming in and already knowing how to use IDL was was so useful. Um, and I know now nowadays you all probably have coding classes and you know as part of your physics major or whatever, but we did not. Um, and so I was a complete beginner in coding uh, when I got to that internship. So, but I, I think also just understanding how to work on problems and. Being ind independent, my advisor during that internship was often in uh, the Netherlands for part of it, and so I, I, was, I had to work independently. And as a grad student, that's a really good skill to have to be able to, to push your project forward even if you're not meeting regularly with your advisor. So I think that internship definitely prepared me for, for grad school. Yeah. Um, a lot of them, yes, junior, but there are, so the Astrobiology Academy, the one that I did when I was a junior, you can actually do that when you are a senior, when, you're, when you just graduated. Um, Intern.nasa.gov is great because you can actually, uh, you can search by year, the year in school that you are and it'll just spit out all the opportunities that are available. Um, there's definitely programs for freshmen and sophomores um, as well, uh, but I think most of them are kind of aimed toward juniors or recent graduates. Questions? Yeah. Um, so the question is, am I studying other planetary bodies now? And no, I actually don't do any of my own scientific research now. So for a while, when I first took this job, um, I had a, I negotiated a, a percentage of my time to be able to still do my own. Uh, planetary science research, but over the past eight years, that's gotten less and less. Um, so I, I don't do any planetary science. And sometimes I do find myself quite wistful because I, I, I miss being at telescopes. I miss making my own scientific discoveries. But I really felt like I did what I wanted to do um, with my own science. And now facilitating the science of others is just as rewarding for me. So when I see you know, my students now, um, getting, you know, going off into, into grad school and um, and having, in, you know, incredible experiences themselves. That to me gives me the same excitement that I used to get with my own research. Yeah. <clears throat> um, other education and outreach programs. So there's there are not a lot of internships that are specifically designed for education and outreach. There are some programs at, I know NASA Goddard, if you're interested in um, science writing and scientific visualization, uh, like you know, mo making movies of various scientific uh, 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 data, data sets, there's a, the Goddard SVS, Scientific Visualization Studio. I know they, they do take interns. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different ways into education and outreach. It's kind of, I'm kind of unusual in that I have a PhD. A lot of people come at it either from a bachelor's or from a master's, or they come at it, you know, they might have a, a, a bachelor's in physics, but then they really focus on the writing side of it because they want to be a science writer or things like that. So I'm sure there are uh, a lot of, a lot more science writing internships. That's another way in. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, that nowadays there's just so much, you can Google so many things that just, I, there, and there's so many now lists of internships, um, pathways to science, um, you know, just going on, on, on all these, these job registers. Uh, yeah, so, I, but check out Goddard SVS, that, that would be a good one. Yeah. Um, really take time on your application essays. I know those are difficult to write and you feel weird because you're kind of, but I think I think um, having a well having a well written essay really matters. Even if you're applying in physics, they want to see that you can write, and um, that and study for your GREs, <laughs> um, because especially just the general GRE, you know, we've it's not the the math is like way you know we're all physics majors, so the the math is not comparable to what you do in in your physics GRE. 
but it's, it's been a while since you've you know, done that sort of math. It's kind of like high school level math. So just, just study for it and make sure you do well um, because it, it, um, it matters, at least according to some of the faculty members I've talked to. So. Oh, and my other recommendation would be uh, apply to graduate fellowships. Um, I got an NSF fellowship. I got it my, um, I, I applied for it my senior year at Dartmouth. Not really knowing what I wanted to do, but uh, wrote, wrote it anyway and ended up getting it. And I know now they have, they have a rule about when you can apply, so you do need to, to think about when you, when you apply. But having a fellowship in grad school is so great because you get paid a little bit more, so you can you know, eat a little bit better than ramen noodles. And, <laughs> and you, um, you get, have that freedom because all the faculty want to work for you because you're free, or work for you, work with you because you're free, so they don't have to use their grant to pay for you. So it's kind of like it's this great position to be in when you, um, when you go to grad school if you, if you are able to get a fellowship. So don't be intimidated by the application. That's all I'm saying. So, any other questions? All right.